Well, hello, everyone. It's so glad you're with us this weekend. We're in a series called Finding Your Way. We're talking about navigating uh, life's toughest temptations. And it reminded me of a story in my life from a few years ago. And Lisa, my wife, and I, we, we got a chance to go to a place called Banff, Canada. Anyone ever been to Banff? Unbelievable. Absolutely stunning beauty. Mountains just you know, rising up. It was, it's incredible. I was speaking at a conference. The conference was over, and we had a couple days to ourselves. And so we thought, let's go some, do some exploring. So we went up to a place called Lake Louise. Has anyone been to Lake Louise? It's a, it's a glacier-fed lake. It's crystal clear blue. It's on. Believable. It's just breathtaking when you're there. I think they got some pictures for me. And so they, we were walking around the lake and just seeing the different perspectives of the lake. And we get to the other side of it, the back side of it, and we see some rock climbers up on the rocks. And I checked, and Pastor Craig was not there. Um, but but uh, then I look to my left, and I see this path, this amazing path. And you, you need to know that my wife, Lisa, she likes to hike, but I love to hike, you know. And so she looks at me, and I look at her, and there's no words exchanged, but she understands. She's like, yeah, go ahead. And so I take off up the path, hoping to find the source of all the water that created this beautiful lake. And so I'm up the path, and I'm heading up, and it's getting higher. It's the first day of June, and you would think that the path would be clear, but I get to this point where it's all snow. I mean, there's just, just all snow, and so now I'm traveling through the snow. I've got tennis shoes on. This is not the right pack, but I'm, I'm getting up there, and I, I get all the way up to the top, and I'm falling through the snow Come sometimes. That's a different story, but I get to the top. I make it, and I'm looking around, and it's absolutely stunning and beautiful. I look back down to the valley, and I see this beautiful picture. The lake is in the background, and I'm having a moment. I'm just, oh, God, you are so good. This is unbelievable. I'm listening to the creek, and I'm hearing the, the animals, and th there's a couple of the guys that come up right after me, but I, I'm just like, okay, I have a time frame because Lisa allows me to play, but a, there, I, there's a sandbox, but I got to stay in the sandbox, right? So I, I've got to get head back down, and so I start heading back down, and I get to this point. I get to this place where there's a fork in the road. It's not really in the road. It's in the snow. And, and I can't tell, do I, do I go down or do I go up? And logic tells me I'm going down the mountain, so I need to go down, so that's what I do. And I, I get about a mile down that, that, traf, that, uh, that trek and that path and, and realize, okay, that wasn't right. I have now made a mistake, and I'm going to be late. But I don't want to be late, so I'm thinking, you know what? It can't be that far up to the path over there. I think I'll take a shortcut through the woods. And so I, I cross the, the creek and I, I get into the woods and I'm starting to walk through and the snow is getting deeper and the woods are getting thicker. And then it hits me, Scott, you're an idiot. <laughs> there are bears and wolves and lynx in these, in these woods. They warned us the sign at the beginning said, be careful, you know. And so I'm like, you need to go back and backtrack and go back to the right path. And so I backtrack across the creek and I'm climbing up, but now the sun's starting to go down. Everything's turning to ice and I've got tennis shoes on. This is no good, but I, I make it to the top and then I, I scurry back to the, to the end. And, and there's Lisa where the rock climbers used to be. They're not there anymore. And she's like, hi. Tell me what happened. And I told her what happened, and, and she understood. I mean, yes, she did increase our life insurance significantly, but she, but she understood. She understood, and you know, this is just her husband. And, and what I learned from that story is this. The, the path that you take, it matters. The path you take matters. Hey, join me in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. We've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount, and God has taught us so many good things. We, we began with the, the character that catches God's eye, and then we talked about the difference between true spirituality and, and false spirituality, and that the, the bar of, of spiritual life, the bar of, right, the bar of righteousness is much higher than religious leaders of Jesus' time or religious leaders of our time. There's something more going on here. We get into chapter 6, we're talking about how motives, motives matter. It's not what you do, it's, it's why you do what you do that matters just as much. And then we get into chapter 7, and we're, we're walking through, uh, the, the, you know, hey, be careful how you judge other people, because there's a, there's a standard that you use, it's going to be measured to you in return, and so be careful about those things. Not that you don't judge, but be careful how you judge. And then last week, Craig reminded us, listen, God doesn't give us stuff because we're good. He gives us stuff because he's good. And so here we are in verse 13, and all of a sudden, the whole landscape changes. Everything is different from this point on. We're, we're going from, from uh, discussion to 
decision from how we behave to what we believe, how we live with people to how we live for God. And, and so everything changes in this moment. So let's pick it up in verse 13 of chapter 7. Here's what it says. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. What we have in this verse is four comparisons. There's two gates, and two roads, and two crowds, and two destinations. And what we see is these extremes that Jesus is using. He's asking us to consider what we're, what we're going to do at this point in time. There's, there's extremes. There's, a, uh, there's a, a wide gate and a small gate, a broad road and a narrow road. A lot of people and very few people. And there's destruction and there's, and there's life. And, and you know things are changing at this verse because for the rest of the sermon, everything's in twos. It's like Noah. Everything is in twos. There are two prophets. There are two trees. There are two types of fruit. There are two types of people. There are two builders, two foundations, two results. And what Jesus is calling us to in this moment is a choice. He's saying now is the time to decide what you really believe and how that ripples into how you behave. What do you believe about me and what I have said in this sermon so far? You know, it's not unusual for the people of God to be called to decision. It's not. It's, and decisions where there's only two options, it's not, it's not unusual. Think about, for a second, back to the time of, of Moses and they're getting out of Egypt and they get to the edge of the promised land and he sends 12 spies into the land and they come back and say, yep, the land is definitely fruitful. It's amazing. But 10 of them, 10 of the 12 spies say, but there's, but there's giants there. We like, we're like grasshoppers in their side and honestly in our own side. And there's two of them that say, no, 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 God promised us. God has led us to this point. He's going to keep leading us. We should trust God. But, but you know in life that the majority is always right. So they go with the 10 and they don't listen to God. And the result is God puts them on a path and they're wandering around the desert for 40 years. And the older generation who wouldn't believe God dies out. And they're hoping that the younger generation will believe God. And then we get to the place and they're right beside the promised land again in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse, verse 15. And Moses says this, speaking for God, he says, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Does that sound familiar to the narrow road? It's the same, same, kind of, same kind of thing. And then the next book, the book of Joshua, Joshua, they've, they've gone into the land, they've, they've, they've conquered the, the land, and they haven't really obeyed God completely, but somewhat. And so they're at the end of Joshua's life, and Joshua's like, no, 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 no. Let me just have one more conversation before I go. He says this, and you probably have this on a pillow or on, you've got it tattooed. This is Denver. We can tattoo, right? So you have a tattoo. You have something on a, on a screen or whatever, but you, it says this. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. And Joshua says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Chapter 24, verse 15. Or, or later on in the life of, of Israel, they're at a place where they've gone through the judges and now they've got the kings and Elijah is a prophet of God and, and, and all the people of God have kind of fallen away and he feels like he's all alone and he's now battling against, against 400 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Asherah and they're, 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 they're arguing and he's talking to the crowd and he, and he says this, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal is God, follow him. There's no wiggle room. It's yes or no. In or out. Black or white. With me or against me. It, it sounds like an absolute. And I got to be honest, that we Americans, we hate absolutes. We just, we just hate them. We like options. That's why we like Cheesecake Factory. Because we like options. 27 pages with 15 options on each page. It's wonderful, you know? And everything on every page looks so good and is so bad for you. It's just great. We, we love that. And you're like, I, I don't know what to choose. It doesn't matter. Just, you can be here for 746 times. You'll still get something different. It'll be awesome. We love options. That, okay, that, that's why we like Amazon. Because you go to the store and they're like, well, which one do you want? Do you want the black one or the 
black one. But you go on Amazon, you got all these different options. It's so good. You get it mailed to you, and it's free, and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's awesome. That's why we like Denver, because Denver's a metropolitan area. They have everything you could possibly want, except a beach, but beach is overrated. But they have everything else. You know, and it's like, oh, I love living in Denver. I got so many choices of restaurants and places to go and things to do. And it's just, it's amazing. That's why we like Netflix. Let's just admit it. I'm in mean, the movie theater. You got five choices of the movie theater. But Netflix, you have thousands of choices. Now, we have to admit it's not enough for us, which is why we have Prime Video as well. And Hulu and, and, Hulu and Disney and YouTube and all the other. But, but, but listen, we love options. We hate ultimatums because ultimatums make us feel like we're not in control. And we like to be in control. But here we're talking about not just this life, but the life to come. We, we don't be in control in this life, but in the life to come, we think, well, why can't we be in control of that too? I mean, why can't we come up with our own truth? I mean, let's find our truth, live our truth, speak our truth, like truth is something that comes from us. Let's set our own agenda. Let's, let's create our own path. Let's do our own thing. And, and if we make a mistake, you know, in life you make a mistake and, you know, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger and everyone makes mistakes and you know, we should be okay with those kind of things. We can just kind of call a mulligan or, you know, phone a friend or, you know, get a get out of jail free card, right? We can just do that kind of stuff in, in this life. So why not in the life to come, right? But what if we're wrong? What if in the most important things in life, there really are only two options? What if the stakes are higher than we ever understood? And the decisions we make are irreversible, and the consequences are irrevocable. And you're thinking, I am so glad that Craig brought this guy in. He's such a happy guy, you know? Listen, this is real stuff. This is real thing. Now, in this, in this passage, what we see is something in play called the principle of the path. The principle of the, of the path. And I'm going to give you four parts to this principle, three of them right now and one a little bit later. But I just want you, if you're taking notes, this is where you start to take notes, right here, because these are things to think about. So uh, principle number one, part number one, everyone is on a path. Everyone is on the path. Every, every, every breath you take, every step you make, you know, Sting doesn't know anything, but he knows this. Uh, he, he, God's watching you, you know, so it, you, you, you're on a path. You're, you're taking steps. And every, it, listen, life is not random. Life and your actions in life are not disconnected. They are a path. Now, you may say, oh, I'm just not really sure, but think about this. All of us have probably either have been teenagers or had teenagers, and at some point in time in life, this conversation comes up. You see your kid doing something or your parents see you doing something, and they have a, a family meeting with you, and they say, listen, son, daughter, we, we love you. Uh, we're so grateful to be your parents. Um, but lately, you've been making some decisions, and they'll say this, and, and if you keep on this track, I can tell where this path leads. I've been down that road. You don't want to go there. Or I have friends who've been down that road. Or Aunt so-and-so is always the bad person. Aunt so-and-so has been down that road. Listen, you, you don't want to be like her, do you? I mean, you, it, it, what we understand is it's, it's a path that our decisions, that our actions, they're, they're not disconnected. In fact, they're, they're, they're definitely connected and sometimes they're cumulative. That life is not random. It's one step at a time. The second principle apart is, is this, that decisions determine direction. Decisions determine direction. That our decisions matter. What we choose today isn't just all by itself. It, it builds up and it's decision after decision after decision that make the path that we have. And all of a sudden we look back. One day we're over here like, how did I get here? But if we look back, it's like, okay, that decision led to that one, led to that one, led to that one, and that's why I'm, I'm here today. Listen, no one wakes up in the morning and says, hey, you know what, today I think I'll make decisions that will ruin my marriage forever. But it happens, doesn't it? That coworker, a new coworker comes in, you're, you're like, okay, that's an interesting person, and you begin to spend time with them. 
and you begin to have lunches together, and you begin to see your feelings kind of go that direction, but you don't tell this person over here, whether it's your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, because, you know, we're as sick as our secrets, but we, don't, we, don't, we think we can handle this, and we're, just, we're fine, and we don't say anything, but we continue on this path, and we take another step, another decision, another decision, another decision, and one day we're, we're cheating. We've fallen over the edge, and we think, how in the world did I get there? We go back, and we've got our tail between our legs. We're like, I had no idea this would happen. But the, the, the partner looks back and says, but don't you see the path? Don't you see? No, no one wakes up in the morning and says, I want to make decisions today financially that are going to ruin me for the next 20 years. But it happens, doesn't it? I mean, you, you get off to college, and... You get that credit card, woo you know. You've got your own credit card now. Your parents told you, listen, only use, it for, only use it for emergencies, but man, that pizza, I'm so hungry, that's an emergency right there. And those pants, I gotta have those pants, those boots, I gotta have, I gotta have that trip, and we're just maxing out the credit card, and you're like, oh no, I maxed it out. But the good news is, there are other credit card companies out there who will also give you one. And so you get another credit card, and you max that one out. But, but now you're starting to move forward in life, you're trying to mature, and, but now you're getting married, and, and, and she brings debt into the relationship, and you bring debt in the relationship, and all of a sudden, it's like, how did we get here? I didn't see this one coming, and everyone else is like, you don't see the path? You, you don't see the path? Your decisions led to this direction. Part number three is this direction, not intention, determines destination. Direction, not intention, determines destination. We love to, to talk about our intentions. We all have lots of good intentions. I really meant to call you. I really meant to fix that. I really meant to exercise. I really meant to save. I really meant to... And, Oh, the goodness of my heart. You need to understand the goodness of my heart. But here's the thing, okay? Good intentions are no good. Good intentions get us nowhere. Yes, we can give people the benefit of the doubt, but when it comes to intention, intention doesn't matter. What matters is not intention, but attention. Because what has our attention has our action. And so we, we have to look at, uh, re- recognize that when we, when we have a direction, not intention, it determines destination. The direction we're going matters. And we've got to stop and look and say, okay, is this the direction that I really want to go? Okay. We're in Denver, and let's say we want to go to Kansas City. And so we get on I-70 west. Now, for you directionally challenged people, Kansas City is not west, it's, it's east. We can go as long as we want to in this direction, but it's direction, not intention. We intended to go to Kansas City. We, we may want to go to Albuquerque, but if we get on 25 north, we're not getting there because Albuquer- Albuquerque is south. Now, we may get to Banff, which is a whole lot nicer than Albuquerque, but the point is, and if you're from Albuquerque, don't, don't compl- I mean, listen, my, if you want to complain about that, then my email is uh, craig at missionhills.org. But, you know, so, so listen, it's direction, not intention, that determines destination. Life is a path. Our decisions matter. We need to stop and look at our direction and say, if I continue on this path, where will I end up? Let's go back to Jesus, and he's talking about these two paths, these, this wide path and this narrow path. Now, we all know what the wide path is, don't we? The wide path is the way of the world. The wide path is life without God. The wide path is the one that, the, that, the, that society is heading toward. As I thought about the wide path, I wrote down, here's all the descriptions of the wide path that I've heard, not all of them, but many of them. It's the go with the flow path. It's the everybody's doing it path. It's the look out for number one path. It's the instant gratification path. It's the if it feels good, do it path. Back in the 70s, they used to put stickers on bumpers of cars, and one of them was this. If it feels good, do it. Does anyone remember that? If it feels good, do it. Now, if that bumper sticker was actually here today, I have a plan. I know exactly what I would do. If I see a car with a bumper sticker that says, if it feels good, do it, I'm going to get back behind it. I'm going to hit that gas pedal and boom. And they're going to get out of the car and come to me and say, what were you thinking? I'm like, I was just taking your advice. That felt great, you know? So 
It makes no sense, but that's what we do. And in the, in the wide path, we think that we are the master of our soul. We are the master of our destiny. So I can live however I want. I can treat people however I want. I can approach God however I want because all roads lead to God, right? That's the wide path. Now, here's the thing. The wide path has a nasty tendency to overpromise and underdeliver. We think we're going to find fulfillment and joy and peace and purpose and meaning in this, in this wide path. But we're almost always, if not always, and always eventually disappointed with the wide path. So there's a pastor in Jacksonville, Florida. His name is Joby Martin. Joby talks about the, the dog racetracks that they have in Jacksonville. Now, I'm not condoning the racetrack, and neither was Joby, but... but and again, if you want to complain, it's Craig at missionhills.org. So, um, but, but, but he, would, he said a friend actually took him to them. He said, I got to see this. I got to see what this is. And so they go to the racetrack and he looks down. The track's bigger than he thought. And all the dogs are over here and they're, they're kind of kenneled and, but they're playing with each other. They're having fun. They're, they, they like each other, but they're, they're kind of squirrely. And all of a sudden the announcer says, here's Rusty. And Rusty is this mechanical rabbit. And they put the mechanical rabbit out in front of the gate and they, they just, the dogs are going nuts. They're in a frenzy because they got to catch the rabbit. And next thing you know, the gate goes down and the rabbit takes off and the dogs take off and, and they're about to catch it when the rabbit ends the race and goes back into, a, into hiding. And the dogs are just in there, you know, just wondering what happened. And, and, you know, one of the dogs won the race and people bet on it and all that sort of stuff. The dogs are like, what happened to the rabbit? I really wanted the rabbit. Good news is the next day, guess what happens? The dogs are all together. Here's Rusty. You know, Rusty shows up. Gate goes down. They chase him around. And this happens day after day, week after week, month after month. And they keep wanting the rabbit. If I just had the rabbit, life would be full if I had the rabbit. Now, eventually, the dogs actually catch the rabbit because the mechanical arm fails, and they catch the rabbit. You know what they say? Those, those dogs never run well again because they caught the rabbit. And it wasn't what they thought. Here's my question. What rabbit are you chasing? What's the rabbit that you think if I just catch it, that's going to be fulfillment? That's going to give me my identity, my purpose, my meaning, my happiness. It could be career. It could be another person. It could be a position. It could be power. It could be fame. It could be a lifestyle. It could be any one of those things. I'm just going to tell you that all those things are like ladders that are leaning against the wrong wall. Climb up to the top and you'll see that. Is that it? That's the, that's the wide path, over-promise, under-deliver. But there's another path. It's the, it's the narrow path. It's the Jesus path. And the narrow path is definitely counter-cultural. It says few find it. That's because few are looking for it. They're all looking at the wide road. They're always looking at the wide path, thinking that is the way to life, but it turns out not to be. See, it's countercultural, which means it's not going to be the popular path. It is the road less traveled by definition. And it's countercultural. It's going a different way. It's the go against the flow path. But it's also the narrow road is, is counterintuitive. In other words, it doesn't make sense to society, but sometimes, sometimes it doesn't make sense to us either, does it? I mean, think about some of the things that Jesus said in this, in this passage in, in the book on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. If someone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other one. If someone forces you to go a mile, go a second mile. If they steal your shirt, give them your coat. I mean, that doesn't sound right. It definitely doesn't feel right. It's because it's counter. Intuitive. And then outside this, he talks about, hey, you know, to, to be first, you got to be last. To, to die, to live, you must die. To, to gain, you must lose. All that is just so counterintuitive. And sometimes they get to the place where I'm like, okay, God, I'm not sure. Maybe I should, I'm not, shouldn't ask this question, but does anyone ever have a problem with anything the Bible says? <laughs> yeah, me, me too. And so I got I to gotta wrestle with those things. And, and I've had this wrestling uh, match with God. And, you know, I've, I've only figured out one thing, um, that there's one God, and I'm not him. And that God has a perspective that's so much wider, so much bigger, so much more through history, so much, so much better than I have. And I just know that every time I've you know, been confused about what God says, but I, I trust him anyway, it's turned out that he's right. 
and I was wrong. And I've had to wrestle with those things. But these days, there's so many things that society says is right, that the wide road says is right. For example, sex. Sex, you know, the Bible says that sex is to be constrained to inside of marriage between one man and one woman who are, who are in marriage, which is another restraint, marriage. One man, one woman. And yet we say, well, but why can't we have freedom? And we got forgiveness, right? So we can just kind of do it and say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, get out of jail free. And we just, we want to live that way. But everything God writes is either to protect us or to provide for us. And there's a reason bigger than we understand. And the question is, will we trust God? Will we believe him in those, in those things? And if I really want to offend everybody, let's just talk about money for a minute. The Bible says, give first, save second, live on the rest. That the first 10% should be given to God. And, uh, and you're like, ah, that's 10%, that's, that's a lot. I mean, who does he think he is? God? I'll just tell you, listen, um, God's a gentleman. Uh, the government just takes your money, doesn't ask you. They just take it. At least God asks you to consider it. You know, He's, but the thing is, God doesn't, good news, God doesn't want 10%. He wants 100%. And not just your money. He wants all of you, your thoughts, your time, your talent, your treasure, your touch. He wants, he wants all of you. He wants your whole life aligned around his purposes because he loves you. And he has a plan for your life. See, there's a difference between the Bible being unclear and the Bible being unpopular. <laughs> it's not unclear. It's not, the, it's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that confuse me or frustrate me. It's the things I do understand that I don't want to do. That's the counterintuitive nature of, of following Jesus. But, but here's the thing. You, you cannot follow God with conditions. God, I'll follow you if. You can't follow him with conditions. It's all in. It's, it's either all in or, or it's all or nothing. It's in or out. We either follow God, follow God uh, in everything or we don't follow God at, at all. We, we have to make a choice. He's asking us to make a choice, not just in this life, but the life to come. You're saying, well, it just seems like, you know, there's, there's some wiggle room here. And that seems like a good path over there. And I, maybe I can do both. And, and there's a, a Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says that there's a way that appears right. But in the end, what? It leads, it leads to death. We have to trust God without conditions in our life. How we live today should be determined by what we believe about tomorrow. So I just want to take a minute. I want you to see a verse. This is how it explains this idea of the, of the wide path and the narrow path better than any other. It's Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you to think about this. Romans chapter 6, verse, verse 23. On the left-hand side of this verse, of Romans 6, 23, are these three words, the wages of sin is death. W wages are what we earn or deserve. Sin is what we've done, and sin is it's an archery term. If you're shooting at the perfect middle, they would measure it from the middle to where your arrow hit. They said you sinned by this much. It just means missing God's perfect mark in your life. The wages of sin is, is death. Death is not just the physical death we all experience, but it's, it's separation from God. So what we earn or deserve for missing God's perfect mark is separation from him. And that, that's, that's difficult, but that's the wide road. We, we all have sinned, right? We, we've not hit God's mark perfectly. We've all missed the perfect mark, right? And we were all sinners in the room, right? We're, we're all on this side. But the verse continues, and where there is bad news, there's, there's a but, and there's good news on the other side. And, and it says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so what we have on the, on the other side, on the right side, is, is good news. This is all bad news. This is, this is good news. And the good news is there's a gift. The difference between a wage and a gift is we can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's free. And the difference between sin and, and God is, is sin is missing God's perfect mark. But God is perfect. And he has a perfect love for you and for me. And that rather than having death, which is separation from God, the gift is this, eternal life. It's, it's being with God forever. And yet we, we stand on this side and we're asking, how do we get over there? How do we get to God? And some people say, well, we, we, I, I work really hard, but do hardworking people sin? Yes. Yeah, so what do we deserve? Separation. How about religious people? Do religious people sin? Well, we know they do. So what do they deserve? Death. But, but the news is, the, the, the verse isn't finished. It says, in Christ Jesus our Lord. So put in the middle this cross of Christ. In Christ Jesus, there's now a bridge. Listen, the wages of sin is death. What did Jesus do? 
He died. And it's almost like we had a paycheck that said, a paycheck said, well, what you earned for what you did is you deserve death. And Jesus lived a perfect life, and what he earned was, was life. And he walked up to you and said, so do you want to switch paychecks? I'm like, what? Yeah, I'll, if, I'll give you life if you give me, I'll, 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 you know, yeah, I'll, I'll, you t- I'll take your sin and you take my righteousness. What do you think? If you just trust me, really? What do I need to do? No, just trust me. Believe I died for you. Trade paychecks with me. Do you see the difference between the two sides? On, on, the, on the first side, this is, this is trying. On the other side, it's trusting. On the first side, it's achieving. This is believing and receiving. And this side is religion. This side is relationship. This side is works. This side is, is grace. This is what we do. This is what Christ has done. And here's the question. What are you trusting in? What are you trusting in to get you to eternal life? See, the, the greatest temptation of life is to trust that we got this. We got it figured out. We, we can do this. We can earn our way. We, we got this. The biggest temptation is to trust in ourselves. But what Jesus says, listen, no, no, you can't, but I love you. I gave my life for you. And I'm asking you to trust me, not just in this life, but in the life to come. Let me ask you, what are you trusting in? to get you to heaven? What are you trusting in to please God? What are you trusting in to get to eternal life? Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse six, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. (laughs) In John chapter 10, verse seven, he says, I am the gate. He says, I am the gate. I am the path. I am the life. Just trust me. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter's talking about Jesus. He says, there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, John's writing this. He says, the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and that life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. And the challenge is this, that everyone lives forever somewhere. And it's all based on what we believe about what Jesus said. Do we really believe that we can do it on our own? That's our temptation. Or do we believe that Jesus Christ died for us? That's the truth. We've got to make that choice. So in 2009, I was pastoring in in Arizona. And I may have told this story to you before, but it, it fits perfectly in this conversation uh, we had just done the Purpose Driven Life as a church uh, for a second time, and all we ask this time is not everyone jump into everything, but what's the one thing God's asking you to do? What's the one next step in your path? And so some people started praying with their spouse. Some people started inviting their neighbor to church. Some began to create relationships with people outside the church. Uh, some became Christians. Some were baptized. Some went on mission trips. I had about 1,000 people who said, I need to be discipled in my faith. And so everyone was making a decision. Well, the baptism decision, we had 100 people say they want to be baptized. You need to understand at that point in time, we never baptized more than 80 people in a year in our church. And 100 people signed up in a weekend. God was at work in a powerful way. We're so grateful for that. But we had a problem because we were a Baptist church without a baptistry. I mean, we baptized so few people. We just did it in people's pools and stuff like that. We got 100 people now. What do we do? We had a pool maker in the church. And I went to him and said, hey, could you make us a pool? Like for baptistry and portable? We can tear down and do that kind of thing. He's like, sure. I said, well, can you make us two? He said, why would you want two? I said, well, we got like 100 people being baptized in a week, and that'll take forever. So my idea is this. We'll have someone being baptized over here while this person over here is getting in the water, and they're getting baptized, and this person over here is getting in the water, and we got spirit. Yes, we do. We got spirit. How about you? And we're just going to go back. We're just going to go back and forth. It'll take less time. We can celebrate it. It'll just be a great moment. He's like, I can do that. So he, he does it. He builds these pools for us, and I'm out that weekend. It's uh, March the 7th of 2009, and I'm in Ohio, and I'm on my way back. I'm actually flying into Denver and then to Phoenix, and for some reason, Ohioans don't like Phoenix. They like uh, Colorado better, and so uh, I'm trying to fly back. Well, at that point in time, it's the nighttime, and Chad's speaking, and he's just finished a 20-minute sermon. He's saying, okay, if you're interested in being baptized tonight, line up, and 25 people go to this wall, and 25 people go to that wall, and it's going to be a great night, and about that time, there's disturbance over in the balcony, and it comes up on the screen. There's, there's a problem here. 
And uh, so he says, hey, listen, there's a disturbance up here. It's an emergency, medical emergency. Would you guys just break into groups and pray for whatever's going on there? And I'm going to go up and see what happened. Jerry Robinson, 51-year-old father of four, has collapsed. And he has fallen on the floor. We had a medical team. They were, they were there within 30 seconds working on him. But it was obvious this was serious. And in fact, what we found out later, he actually died right there in the service. You know, Jerry, that afternoon, he was teaching our kids that afternoon, talking about the hope of heaven. And he went into the service, and you know, we were taking communion. He came in a little bit late, and my wife was sitting right beside him, and she said, well, here, take my elements. And she said, no, I don't want to do that. I said, no, you, you take them, because I'm going to be in all the services this weekend. And he's like, okay. So he, he takes communion with God, and he goes to have communion with God in that moment. So Chad's walking back up front, and the, the ambulance has been there, and they, they take him out. It's been about 20 minutes. People have been praying. People have been standing against the wall, 25 here, 25 there, and he walks up to the stage, and as he walks up, one of the other pastors puts his arm around him and says, what are you going to do? He says, I, I, I don't know. He walks up to the stage, and he's like, God, give me wisdom, and he says, listen, uh, Jerry Robinson has a medical emergency. Um, I've known Jerry for years. I was a youth pastor in another church before I was here, and his kids grew up in my youth group. I know Jerry. I know his family. Listen, Jerry came here tonight. He came to celebrate God's goodness through baptism, and this is what Jerry would want to do. I think it's what God wants us to do, so we're going to go ahead and do that, and he went to the band and said, could you guys play like some, some soft music, and let, we'll do this. Uh, we'll just play soft music, and let's just reverently uh, worship God and celebrate this, and so the music begins, and they start baptizing over here and over here, and people start singing, and they're raising their hands in worship, and some are baptized over here again, over there, and over here, and and I got both hands up in worship. And after a while, baptism, baptism, baptism. People are standing and just shouting to the Lord, the goodness of God. <laughs> and the strangest thing happened. The, the, the lines for baptism didn't get shorter. They actually got longer in that moment. I flew back that night. I heard about it when I was here at the airport. I, I flew back and I was watching the video of what happened the, the day before and we started having this conversation about Jerry and his life and about how he followed God and how these people were following God. And, and we came up with a statement. And the statement was like this. You realize that now is always the right time to follow Jesus, right? Now is always the right time to follow Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, what's been done to you, how long you've been gone, how deep the hole is you dug, how far away you've been. Right now is the right time to follow Jesus. We didn't baptize 100 people that week. We baptized 364 people that weekend. Because they understood they were on a path and, and our decisions determine our direction. And what these people wanted to do, they wanted to follow God with all their heart and soul and mind and, and strength. And they were tired of chasing rabbits. And they wanted to chase God instead. And so I'm wondering today, Mission Hills, what about you? Now is always the right time to follow Jesus. So I'm wondering, for those of you who are believers, maybe there's something that you're like, you're, you're trying to follow Jesus somewhat, but there's no such thing as somewhat obedient or somewhat following. We give our whole life, either Jesus is Lord of all or not Lord at all. And, and today's the day you say, okay, God, I, I know I mess up and I know I've got, you know, you say my, my, my eternal life is secure, but my fellowship's not right. I want to I walk with you. And so you say, God, I, this, this area of my life, I just, I give it back to you. Maybe some of you are not believers and you've never made that decision about Romans 6, 23, and you're still trusting in your own righteousness, the greatest temptation in the world to trust ourselves rather than what God says. Would you be willing today to step across the line, to take the step and say, I, I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, for those of us who walk with you, we stumble every single day with our thoughts, our words, and our actions. And you're a gracious God, but you tell us if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So those of us who are believers, we just say, everything I have is yours. I belong to you. And this area that I've struggled in, I, I don't want that anymore. I'm tired of chasing rabbits. I, I want to give that to you. And God, I'll, I'll trust you in what you say in those things. While your heads are bowed, and just want you to, to, to show God you mean it. Just if you have something that you're saying, hey God, 
I, I'm messing up here. I just want to give it to you. Would you just raise your hand, and no one's going to see it but me and you, but thank you. Thank you. And maybe on the opposite side, if you're not a believer and you're like, I need Jesus. I'm not even, I'm not even on the narrow path. I haven't even begun because Jesus is the gate. He is the road. He is the way. He is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And I just want to get my eternity straight. My life's still a mess, but I want to get my eternity straight. And so Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. I know I can't earn my way into God's favor, but thank you that you died on the cross for my sin in my place so I could have a relationship with God. If you prayed that prayer, would you raise your hand for the first time and say, Jesus, I want you to lead me in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Father in heaven, you're so good. We're grateful that you love us. Doesn't matter what we've done, where we've been, what's been done to us, you love us. And we're so grateful that you give us this opportunity to make a choice, to, to get back on the right path, to, to turn from our, our ways and to, and to take the, the high road, the narrow road, the right road that leads to life. And so, God, we're so grateful that you give us grace and mercy every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. Mission Hills, walk with Jesus. What a privilege to be with you. May God bless you today.